Hey there. As we survey the damage and struggle to emerge from four years of Trump, one question should be on our minds above all others. How do we make sure this never happens again? Donald Trump could very well run for president again in 2024, and if nothing changes significantly about the US political scene, he could very well win. So how can Joe Biden stop the next Donald Trump presidency? Today, I'm going to propose three possible strategies. Donald Trump made a powerful appeal to those who felt left behind by our whiz-bang financial, technological, and primarily coastal economy. Over the past 40 years, we have intentionally crafted a system where the winners do better and better, and most people do worse and worse. There were arguably good reasons to do this at the time. In the 1970s, it's conceivable that the country was too equal to innovate the way it needed to. It might have made sense to give the wealthy a few more incentives to invest and come up with new stuff. Wherever the right balance was, we hit it at some point before 2008, and we have kept on accelerating in the same direction long past the point of diminishing returns. Donald Trump was elected on a promise to do more for the little guy, but all he ended up delivering was a massive tax cut that made the rich even richer. A lot of folks are already impressed with Joe Biden's moves in this direction. The new stimulus apparently included some pretty impressive new anti-poverty measures, and it seems like the Democratic Congress and the Wall Street figures that own it are a lot less obsessed with the pro-austerity balanced budget mindset than the Obama administration was. There are a lot of quick and easy things that could be done here, like enforce the labor legislation that's already on the books, or give the IRS the money it needs to enforce tax legislation. And there's some bigger picture stuff too, like, oh, I don't know, fixing our horrific healthcare system, or doing some ongoing stimulus through much needed infrastructure spending. I am much more optimistic about the chances for this strategy than I was back in November. That Senate election in Georgia in January really was a game changer. But there's a lot of difficult and long-term work to be done on this issue. And as the Trump crises fade, people are going to get a lot less willing to do that work. And even if Joe Biden proves to be an effective fighter against inequality, positive results might not even show up in time to win the election for the Democrats in 2024. It's obvious that Joe Biden is not going to solve racism. Racial tensions are as American as apple pie, and they are eternal. But they can be changed by a president. Donald Trump just provided a masterclass in making racial tensions worse over the past four years. Interestingly, the best way to improve things with this issue would actually also be to work to solve inequality. The fact that I think these two concepts are directly linked may be surprising to those of you familiar with Twitter wars over which concept is more important to the rise of Trump. Many in the US's right-wing marketing segmentation like the inequality explanation, while many in the left-wing marketing segmentation like the racism explanation. But for those of us who think of politics as more than just a team sport, it's obvious that these two issues are directly linked and feed off of each other. If life gets worse, as it has for like 80% of Americans over the past 40 years, it becomes more attractive to hate the other, whether that's on a racial, ethnic, or even a gender basis. And that's exactly what's been happening. Donald Trump's genius, to the extent that he had it, was his ability to ball all these resentments into real power at the ballot box. As I said, early progress on inequality has been better than I expected, and perhaps that'll feed back into positive developments on race relations as well. I, I hope it does. Unfortunately, I think it's more likely that the COVID-related spike in violent crime will lead to a return to the racist politics of mass incarceration that seemed so dead in the water just two years ago. 
Uh, after all, uh, President Joe Biden has some experience with those politics. I'm also getting a little irritated uh, by the way that we're expected to be so excited that our war machine and our financial apparatus is now controlled by more diverse and female ex executives. Like, wasn't it diverse and woke and fun the way we killed all those anti-ISIS militia members in Syria a couple weeks back? Yay. The truth is that both inequality and racism are tremendously difficult problems that Biden and every president that comes after him are going to have to work to solve. If I were Biden with his tiny congressional majority and his desperate need to hold on to the popularity he has and somehow get more, I would look for the easiest, lowest hanging fruit. And that's what the rest of this video and uh, the upcoming videos over the next few weeks are going to be about. The easiest, lowest cost way that Joe Biden can do an end run around Donald Trump and steal one of his most popular issues. If Joe Biden can make serious strides in this very popular, morally right, and fiscally responsible direction, there's a distinct chance that he could sweep the midterms, allowing him to make even more progress on racism and inequality. Ending the forever wars, or at least seriously dialing them back, would also rob the Donald Trumps and Tucker Carlsons of this world of their very best issue. It is a no-brainer. But it doesn't seem to have been a priority in the first months of the Biden administration. The problem is that a number of foreign policy hawks have managed to convince high-level Democratic and media figures that Donald Trump was somehow a foreign plot and that aggressive pushing of that idea was key to his defeat. This couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, as I've been saying for years, aggressive U.S. foreign policy and the people who make it are one of the main reasons we got Donald Trump in the first place. Every night, we see people like Robert Mueller, James Comey, James Clapper, David Frum, Max Boot, and a wide cast of intelligence community freak shows and war on terror propagandists lionized by people on CNN and MSNBC who should really know better. All these frickin' resistance neocons are the reason Donald Trump is president. For 15 years after 9-11, they lined their pockets with war on terror nonsense. To do this, they created fear. Fear of Muslims, fear of foreign countries, fear about our borders, fear of the disappearing crime in U.S. cities. Donald Trump is the result of their failures and the fear that they have created. In my opinion, we've spent $4 trillion trying to topple various people that, frankly, if they were there and if we could have spent that $4 trillion in the United States to fix our roads, our bridges, and all of the other problems, our airports, and all of the other problems we have, we would have been a lot better off. I can tell you that right now. We have done a tremendous disservice, not only to the Middle East, we've done a tremendous disservice to humanity. The people that have been killed, the people that have been wiped away, and for what? It's not like we had victory. It's a mess. The Middle East is totally destabilized, a total and complete mess. Trump was exactly right about that. If he was actually the whip-smart executive he played on TV, then maybe he would have been able to make some real progress on these issues. But he's not. What Trump actually is, is one of the sheep. He's been sitting in front of a TV for 17 years, eating up all the fear and hate that the James Comeys of this world have been using to win votes and sweet jobs at military contractors like Northrop Grumman. People like Comey aren't evil. They probably believe that all the fear they have cooked up is worthwhile. It helps them fulfill their fantasies of public service and heroism. And with serious people like themselves in charge, all this fear can be controlled. Well, that's over. Donald Trump is a true believer. He lives and breathes all that fear and hate that the James Comeys of the world created to keep their jobs after the Cold War ended. And it is a terrible thing to watch. What the national security state pulled off while Trump was in power is extraordinary. 
They use Trump to heighten tensions all over the world, but they also managed to convince the Democrats that those heightened tensions were necessary to defeat Trump and they should continue now that he is gone. These foreign policy professionals have somehow managed to rig the game so that defense budgets and weapons sales go up no matter who is in power. And to make it all worse, it's all a complete waste of time and money that hurts the U.S. national interest. In January of 2018, U.S. policy changed dramatically. Since 2001, the main foreign policy priority of the United States had supposedly been fighting terrorism. I have a 40-plus video series called Everybody's Lying About Islam on how useless that effort has been, but at least it was something the American people thought they wanted. With January 2018's new defense strategy, the Pentagon quietly announced a shift to great power competition against countries like Russia and China. This seismic shift went largely unexamined because we were all too busy watching the President Trump show. The only nice thing about this shift in strategy is that it's a little more honest. In truth, the United States has been pursuing a tremendously counterproductive policy of great power competition for the past 30 years as well. We have a tremendously expensive foreign policy establishment that was built to fight the Cold War. And for the past 30 years, it has kept on fighting the Cold War, even though the Soviet Union voluntarily dissolved itself decades ago. It kept on fighting the Cold War, even after it supposedly had something better to focus on after 9-11. Our main target for much of a century now has been Russia. When this competition started, the Soviet Empire outweighed the U.S. population by tens of millions of people, and the Cold War opened with their ideology swallowing up whole continents. Seventy years later, the Soviet Empire is gone, Russia has embraced a crappier version of our guiding ideology, and there are almost 200 million more of us than them. Despite all the hype, in the six years since NATO expansion finally turned them rogue, Russia isn't taking continents. It's largely failing to take individual provinces of its old empire. If anything, our competition with China is even more farcical, as I've covered recently. Uh, I'll talk more about our absurd conflict with Iran in the coming weeks. The problem with all of this is that it's mostly meaningless until it isn't. Obama let a bunch of foreign policy hawks convince him to do stupid things in Syria and Libya, which led directly to a massive European refugee crisis and the foundation of the Islamic State. It's easy to forget now that we are all moving on to China panic, but the very cable news friendly threat of the Islamic State and Trump's catering to it with a Muslim ban were a big part of his victory. Trump won by the difference of a few tens of thousands of votes in just three states. If it weren't for the catastrophes brought to us by the foreign policy blob, Donald Trump would have never been president. That's the key thing here for U.S. politics. The downside risks of our forever wars and the great power competitions we keep pushing are massive and unpredictable. At this early point in the Biden administration, it can seem easier to just sort of stick with the status quo and not upset too many defense industry apple cards and not upset too many Congress people in both parties who are owned by the defense industry. This may seem like the safer approach, but it's really not. There's a lot of time between now and 2024, and there's a very good chance that our constant aggression all over the world will produce another issue that's perfect for Donald Trump. But there is good news here. One of these things is not like the others. Inequality and racism are perennial problems that will always be with us. What's more, the president has pretty limited powers to deal with these domestic problems. The forever wars? According to the Constitution and most U.S. laws, Biden can wake up and stop them tomorrow. Now, obviously, it's not that easy. Trump showed that by his complete failure to get out of Syria and Afghanistan, two things he seemed to sincerely want to do. But Biden, even if he is somewhat diminished, really does know how government works and has hired at least a few intelligent people who are eager to help him get it done. 
Trump didn't know anything and almost exclusively hired pro-war people. Biden should end the forever wars and start taking a saner, less militaristic approach to great power competition. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smartest thing to do for the success of his presidency and his party. It's also the best way to stop Donald Trump. The only thing standing in Biden's way is the U.S. foreign policy establishment. Whether you know it as the blob or the deep state, or as I do, as the metastasized military industrial complex, I believe that it is the greatest threat to the survival of this country and the world. Come back next time to hear more about the way that the blob has taken over U.S. politics. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, and I would be grateful if you'd sign up for my email list so I can reach out to you if the YouTube gods ever cast me out. You also get a free PDF essay for signing up. Thanks.